If you've got your Bibles, we're going to dive into the Word. We're learning about Word and Spirit. We're learning about Word and Spirit. And I, I do want to read John 6. Let's use that as a launch pad. John chapter 6, verse 63. Jesus' words, okay? They're in red in your Bible. Today I'm going to try to teach you how to receive revelation knowledge from this Word. Okay? It's so important that we all know if we've got a relationship with Jesus, how do we hear from Him? How does He speak to us through this Word? Okay? We're going we're gonna to learn about how to approach this Word because it's not, even though it's 66 books, it's not just a book. You can't treat it like a book. You can't read it like a novel. You can't read it like a, a natural book where some people go, I've read the Bible. Well, that's great. Just because you've read the Bible doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anything if you memorize the whole Bible. I'm serious. Some people got brilliant minds. I heard that the, the Jewish children would memorize the first five books of the Bible. So it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anything if you've read and memorized every single scripture because that's not knowing the Bible, not, not knowing the author of the Bible. We're actually talking about the author, not just the written word. So it's really, really important you, you actually catch that. We're talking about knowing the one who wrote the Bible. And when we fellowship with the Word, we're not just reading the Word like head knowledge. We're actually fellowshipping with the one who wrote the Word. We're connecting. We're building relationship with the one who's the author of this book. Yes, there's 66 books written by 40 different men over a 1,500-year period. All speak about the same God, same heaven, same Jesus, same salvation, same hell. same. It's all themed together, written by 40 different people on a space of 1,500 years. And there's so much connection, continuity, and theme in the Bible that must be the absolute Word of God. So if you read verse 63, it is, Jesus said this, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh, talking about your physical flesh, body, profits nothing. Then he says, the words that I have spoken to you are Spirit and they are life. So I'd like to present to us that the Word of God comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God comes from the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Spirit and the Word come from the same source, and it's God Himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, my words, they are Spirit. They are life. We, we, we spoke about that last week, that the Word of God carries the presence of God, carries the Spirit of God when He speaks the Word. So faith doesn't come by hearing the Logos not the written word. Faith comes by hearing the Rema word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's in, that's in um, Romans 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But that word, word is Rema. That means spoken. We spoke about that when God spoke the universe into existence. He spoke and he breathed. So he spoke with his, when, when you speak the word, he has to breathe the word. You have to breathe to speak. You can't speak without breathing. Do you know that? Try holding your breath and try to speak. It's, we inhale and we speak when we exhale. That's what makes the sound. I believe when God speaks to you, faith comes with it. Joy comes with it. Peace comes with it. His presence comes with His Word. Now, I know, I just want to show you how it works a little bit. Little bit. I know we said, or people have quoted this, if you have the Word but not the Spirit, you will dry up. If you have the Spirit but not the Word, you will blow up. You know, people get the Spirit, Spirit, no Word, they just blow up. And, and if you have the Spirit and the Word, you will grow up. That's, that's true. It's a true statement. But can I, can I tell you how I see this? If you have the Word in your head only, that's when you dry up. If you have the Spirit without the Word in your heart, you will just blow up. So this is true when the Word, I mean, sorry, well, this first statement is not true unless the Word is in your heart. If the Word is in your heart, you won't dry up because it comes with the presence of God. That's true. That you would, you, If you only have the Word and Word, Word, Word and no Spirit, then it's because you actually got the Word only in your head. There's no reality, there's no relationship, there's no revelation. It's not happening in your heart. It's in your head. This is not a book to be understood with your head only. It's a relationship with the one who wrote the Word. Does that make sense? It's true, like if, if, if you have a move of God by His Spirit, hear what I'm saying. If you have a move of God by His Spirit and He manifests, and there's different expressions when the Word is delivered and when the Spirit is delivered. It's, it, it, the Word and the Spirit come from the same Lord, 
same God, but there are different expressions, different manifestations. So if there's a move of the Spirit and very little word in us, when I think, when I think of the word in us, I'm talking about in our heart, and we're not like Jesus. We're not, the, to, to have the word in your heart means you're more like Jesus. You're more matured to become like Christ. That's the whole purpose of the word, to make us more like Jesus, okay? We are conformed to the image of His Son. In Romans 8, that's our destiny. So now if, there's no, if, if the Word isn't at work in my heart, but it's a move of the Holy Spirit, the move of the Holy Spirit will be shallow. It'll bring healing. It'll be deliverance. It'll be freedom. But if there's no Word, it can't bring you to that level of maturity. It'll set you free, but guess what you're going to need? If you don't have Word, you're going to need that again. You're going to need deliverance again. You're going to need more manifestation. You're going to need more freedom. You're going to need more because you, you fall back into if you don't have the Word. You need the Word to transform you, to change you into like, to be more like Jesus. Now, if we do have the Word inside of us, and I believe the, the Spirit's move can go deeper in our hearts. The move of the Spirit will go deeper to bring us more like Jesus. They work together. One's not more important than the other. That's my point for now. You say, what's more important then? What's more important? Well, it's like saying, which, which, which wing is more important on the airplane, the left or the right? They're just as important as each other. You know, it's like, so I, I, don't, I don't differentiate it. Oh, the move of the Spirit is more important than the Word. Well, if the Word is not at work in our hearts and bring us into Christ, the move of the Spirit will be limited to the degree of our lack of immaturity and lack of Word life in our hearts. I'm not talking about our head, I'm talking about our hearts. Are you with me with that? Very important to understand that so we can mature up. All right. So this is a spiritual book. The best way to say it, it's a spiritual book. It's God-breathed. So I can't understand it with just my head. All right, so I'm going to try to give us some tips, some ideas, um, some context um, for us to be able to spend time with God in His Word and Him speak to us. Okay, I'm going to try to really give you handles to try to, okay, you can go away and actually do this. Is that all right? So do you know the Bible, first of all, um, You've got to be careful how you treat the Bible because, again, it's God's Word, God's love letter to mankind. Right? God's letter to mankind. Think about that way for a second. And it, a, lot, this is a, lot of, a lot of baby Christians do this. And I'm sure you've done this. I've done this. Does God use it? Mm, yes, He does, especially for baby Christians. Maybe you've done this. God, speak to me. <sighs> oh, that's a good word. God spoke to me. Wow. And the next morning, you do it again. Oh, God, speak to me. <laughs> And you just really want a word from God. And you say, come on, God. Oh, that's a good word. And sometimes you get, that's a judgment word. That's not a good word from God. I don't want that one. And so, so that you go it again. Like, like you, if you treat the word like that, come on, God, speak to me. Now, has God used it? 100% he has. He's done it with me. He's done it with probably every one of us. It's pretty dangerous to do, by the way. But let's say I can do this. This is a Bible. I go like this. Oh, that's not a good one. Jesus, uh, Judas went and hung himself. That's not good. I guess. Um, go you and do likewise. That's also in the Bible, by the way. And then another one, uh, what you do is do us quickly. It's also in the Bible. I've just taken three scriptures totally out of context and the Bible told me to hang myself, which obviously it never does. But it's dangerous because you, you're taking scripture out of context. You think, oh yeah, but you know, God can speak to me. I'm not arguing the fact that God can speak that way. If I'm your very best friend, and I went overseas for, for a whole year. And I happened to write you a 10-page letter. And you, use, you treat my letter like that. You know, like, what's Leo saying to me? And you just read the fifth page for a, for a paragraph and just read that. And then the next day you pick up my 10-page letter and you go, I wonder what Leo said to me when he wrote to me. And you do that to the first page. Okay, one verse. And then you do that to the last page the next day. And, and you do that every single day. Are you ever going to get the gist of what I was trying to say to you in that 10-page letter as your best friend? You wouldn't do that to my letter. You want to know the heart, the gist, the theme. What is Leo saying? He's my friend and he's written me a letter from overseas. You wouldn't do that to my letter. So let's not do that to God's letter to us. We've got to know the context of the scripture. So when I first um, read the Bible, because I, I'm a, I'm a, I became a Christian at 19, never picked up the Bible in my life, Catholic background, um, believed in God, but I wasn't born again, didn't know Jesus. I got... I became a Christian. I gave my life to Jesus, got born again. Jesus was my Lord. I have no background, no context of the Bible whatsoever. There's going to be a lot of things I don't understand because I don't understand the context. So I would read the Bible and so many times wouldn't understand what I'm reading. And then one little thing came up. Oh, I can understand that. 
I would, I would understand that and I'd read that and that would feed me. What I would call feed me because it's revelation. It, you know when the scripture jumps out. So there's a lot of context. There's a lot of background. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of, um, I don't know how the, the Jewish, what's Sadducees? What's, what's Pharisees? What's, what's circumcision? What's righteousness mean? What's redemption mean? All these big words maybe that I'm not accustomed to. I don't know really what they mean in their context. And so when I do read something that I do understand, it means I'm at a place of faith and maturity that I can understand that. It's fine. It's great. I get it. But what I didn't do, which was good, I didn't try to interpret something that I wasn't ready to receive. I didn't try to, I've got to understand that. What's that saying? And I, I tried to interpret it in my own mind. If I wasn't ready to receive it, I just keep going. In fact, the book of Acts, when I first read the book of Acts, I, I wasn't getting much out of it because I didn't have the context at all. I thought this is just like a book that's written in, in, like in a course of one or two weeks and I'm, re, I'm reading the, this whole account of the early church and little did I know that from the book of Acts chapter 1 to write Acts chapter 28, it was like 60 to 70 year period. So I'm reading everything out of context and I just did, I wasn't getting much. I wasn't understanding much. I'm just reading and it's like a boring book coming to get over this one and I'm reading and reading, 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 and reading. And then, oh, that jumped out. Well, I understand that. That's good. What I'm trying to say is let it speak to your heart. Don't interpret things in your own strength or in your own mind, okay? That's important because if your faith isn't in the place to receive it, then you're not going to receive it. If your faith and your maturity isn't in a place to understand something, it's because you're not ready to understand it. You will understand what you're ready to receive because it's a relationship between you and God. Does it make sense? So, um, all right, God is so unique. God has made you so unique and so special and such an individual that it's that he uses such an individual unique way to communicate and speaks to you through his word. Each and every one of us as unique as we are, we're going to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit completely uniquely different, but he speaks the word. Everybody say the word. The word, the word to our hearts. Not our own thoughts, our own thinking. I'm going to let the word speak to me. So I don't have a unique interpretation of it because this has its own interpretation from God. But all I'm saying is in my fellowship, in my friend, in the same way I have a relationship with God and I pray and I spend time with God, that's going to be so unique in the same way every single person is unique when they talk with the Father in your own relationship. And He relates to you uniquely different. Well, this is how I'm going to get revelation from the Word. And I'll explain, I'll explain what I mean. We're not talking about just me reading the Word. We're actually talking about the Word reading us. And that's why it's uniquely different. All right. First of all, God reveals his secrets to them that fear him. The word fear is reverentially reverence him. We, we reverentially fear him. And, and, the Bible, and, then the, and also the, it says, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So when you reverentially fear the Lord, it opens up the door for wisdom to come. It's connected to your reverential fear of God. It's connected to your heart towards Him. And then um, Proverbs 3 verse 32 says, God's secret is with the righteous. So the more you and I walk in our righteousness and walk in a righteous heart, the more His secrets are open to us. Now, this is really key because I'm talking about relationship with God. I'm talking about how God speaks to us and He's going to speak to us according to our level of faith, our level of maturity and our, and our level of honour to His Word, our reverence to His Word. Because that's called maturity. That's how he speaks to us. And so it sounds like in Matthew 16, this is what Jesus said, the secrets of the kingdom are not, uh, the secrets of the kingdom are, are revealed to you, but not to them. It's talking to the disciples. The disciples are following Jesus, made him Lord, believed in Christ. They're following Jesus. The secrets of the kingdom are, are revealed to you, but not to them that are outside. That's why I speak to them in parables. So basically, there are secrets of the kingdom. Why is it hidden to an unbeliever? Because they're not following Jesus. And then the other thing is the secrets of the, of the kingdom are hidden for you, not from you. They are hidden, but they're hidden for you. So when you seek God with all your heart, you'll find it. If God didn't do it this way, if you're selfish and, and evil and full of, full of your self-ambition, and you just go, God, show me the secrets of the kingdom. You'll use the secrets for your own kingdom and for your own selfishness. So he won't reveal it to someone that's full of selfish ambition and will destroy the truths of God and destroy his life with it. I mean, that's why we don't know when he's coming back because our selfishness will go, oh, that's when he's coming back. I know exactly the date he's coming back. I'm going to live, up to, I'm going to live, up to, I'm going to live for myself until that day. 
That's what we sinners would do. So God doesn't reveal it. Anyways, let's, let's see how this works. First of all, um, there's a few things we need to see. Now you've got to prioritise. This already starts with this. You've got to prioritise time with His Word. If you say, oh, Leah, I'm so busy, I haven't got time for His Word. It already reveals your heart. If you don't have time for His Word and spend time with Him, change your life. Change your priorities. Can you see, like, why would God reveal, to reveal His secrets and His truths of the way He runs the whole kingdom, which is the most valuable thing you'll ever have, um, to someone that says, I don't even have time to read the Word. And it exposes our heart and our motives. And if, if, if you say, I don't have time because I'm so busy, then change your busy lifestyle. Change your work if you have to. I don't work so much. Change your work. Your work is not more important than your relationship with God. And if just in case you don't believe me, give me your phone and let me see where you spend all your time. You know that thing where it tells you you spend this many hours on this and so many hours. How much on YouTube? How much on games? How much movies are you watching? How many, how many things are you, what are you doing with your time? Social media, what are you doing with your time? Cut that out so that you spend time with God. I mean, that's just the basis. We, we haven't dived in yet, but that shows my priority. I actually want God's Word. Actually, I'm excited to hear from God. I love God. He's the most beautiful person in the universe. I want to hear from my Father. That's the joy that we have in wanting to spend time with Him. Not, not, not you don't approach it, oh, it's my duty, I'm a Christian, I'm going to read my chapter, I read my chapter, I close the book. No, you've got it all wrong if you think you have to read it and I'm doing my duty as a Christian. You, you're spending time with the most beautiful person in the universe and you want to hear from His heart. Speak to me, what are you saying to me today, Lord? Okay, you know, you know um, the Bible talks about meditation. We spoke about it last week, Psalms, that if, if you meditate in the Word day and night, you'll be like a tree planted by the river of water. And in Joshua, same thing, if you meditate in the Word. What's meditation? You know, the, the cow, if you know what a cow does, he chews the cud. He chews the, 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 the grass. He swallows it, apparently he swallows in stomach one and regurgitates and brings it back up and chews on it again. In stomach two, he swallows it and he regurgitates, chews on it again and he goes into stomach three. I think they've got like about four or five stomachs, but he's making milk. We need to do that with meditation. We, we think about it. What does this mean? Lord, what is this saying to me? God, you think, ah, oh, oh, revelation. Wow, bring it back up. Think about it again. Think about that scripture. What is this saying? Read that. What, what does it mean? Like, for example, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's in Ephesians chapter 1. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings. Hang on a sec. I could just read that. It means nothing to me. I could just read that and go, I know that scripture, I memorized it. No, or stop and go, hang on. What is a spiritual blessing? Well, what is a spiritual blessing? I'm talking with the Lord. What is a spiritual blessing? He'd say, well, love is a spiritual blessing. Wisdom is a spiritual blessing. Knowledge is a spiritual blessing. Authority is a spiritual blessing. Joy is a spiritual blessing. Peace is a spiritual blessing. I can go on and on and on and on. And just from one scripture, I go, hang on. I am blessed. Ah, oh, blessed. I'm already blessed. Not I will be blessed. I'm already blessed. With every spirit, every, every spiritual, what, what every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, I'm already blessed. What? Now I'm starting to picture myself already blessed. I already have this. I'm not trying to get it. I already received this. God, because of Christ Jesus, I already have every blessing. I'm not trying to earn for something. I'm not trying to work for something. So what's it doing? Changing my image. Changing my image. Changing the way I see myself. Changing my mindset. I am already blessed with every spiritual blessing. You do that enough to the whole Bible, then you start to believe what the Bible says about you. You meditate. You, oop, a revelation. Bring it back up. Think about that scripture. I could read this scripture. I've been reading for 30 something years, 36 years. And so if I go to a particular book, I might go, um, a lot of times I'll say to the Lord, Lord, what do I need? What do I need to read? What, what, what do I need to spend time in the Word? Like what, what, what is my lacking? You can do that. I, I do believe if you're honest with the Lord, He's your shepherd. He knows, especially the more you know the Word, the more He can direct you in the Word. The more you know the Word. And He's going to say, oh, Leah, you're lacking this lately. Or you're lacking patience. Ah, oh, that's a good thing. Maybe I need to do a study on patience. And I can show you how to do that in a moment. But I'm, I'm fellowshipping with the Lord. And sometimes I, I feel the Lord say, I'll read First John. My first reaction is First John. I've read the First John hundreds of times. What am I going to get out of First John? That's my flesh speaking, isn't it? It's my mind speaking. I know that book. It's only five, uh, five chapters. 
It's so, so short. And I've read it so many times. I love that book. I've got so much out of it. So what am I doing? I'm treating the Word with my head, not my relationship with the Lord. Because I'm, I'm trying to read it with my head. I'm limiting the power of the eternal Word. But when I go to that First John, and I, let's, let's go to uh, the, the book of First John. I just want to show you something because I've brought that up. Um, how, how, does, how does this work? How does it actually work? First John, um, pick it up from uh, verse 15, chapter 2. It says, Do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. Stop. I can, just, I can read that. I can quote that. Do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. For all the things that are in the world are not of the Father, but is of this world. And the lust of the, you know, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, is, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So I could quote it and get nothing out of it. Just because I quote it, I'm not getting food out of it. I'm not getting revelation out of it, am I? I've just memorized it and quoted it. Now I'm going to the Word and fellowshipping with God and going, Lord, your Word says do not love the world. Stop. What areas in my life am I starting to love the world? Am I letting anything creep in and I'm actually loving the things of this world? What is the things of this world? And it says, because it says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay, what area in my life am I loving the world, Lord? I'm fellowshipping with him and I'm allowing him to speak into my intimate life. I'm allowing him to say something to my heart that I can respond to his lordship. See, if you don't want, want to surrender and don't want to walk in obedience, you'll never do this. Don't you reckon? You just want to read the Bible. Uh, I've read it. No, but we're talking about for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. Okay, what's, what areas in my life right now, the lust of the flesh happen to be creeping in? It could be as simple as, Leo, you're spending too much time lying down enjoying Netflix. It could be for me, right? You just know where, where my, I'm at right there. But it, what I'm saying is it's, everyone's different. But now, if I read that in a three months' time, I'm in a different place. That'll speak to me differently. Won't tell me what I needed. If I, if, if, I heard, if I read that a year ago, it's going to be different. If I read that six months ago, it's going to be different. If I read that in two years' time, I'm in a different space. I'm in a different place. I'm in a different fight. I'm in a different struggle. And it will say to me what I need to hear. Now, you can do that to the whole Bible. The whole Bible. It says, for the cares. And what about this? Be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. But with all prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. I can just read it. I'll memorize it, big deal. Or stop, be careful for nothing. But with supplication and prayer and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God will, will rule your hearts and guard your hearts in Christ Jesus. Be careful for nothing. Okay, what does that mean? Don't worry about anything. Yeah, okay, Lord, is there anything in my life that I'm worrying about? What, I, what areas in my life right now am I taking care about? Am I actually worrying about so now, can you see I just twisted it? I'm not just reading it. I'm bringing it. I'm letting the Word be a mirror. The Bible says the, the Word is a mirror. It's the, it's the perfect law of liberty. And no one looks in the mirror and forgets what he looks like. You're supposed to look in the mirror and it tells you how you look like. So the mirror of the Word tells me this is who you are in Christ Jesus. Wow! But it's supposed to, you're supposed to fix yourself. Because if you don't look like that, you've got to change your life to look like what you look in the mirror. So that's why I'm asking these questions. You can do that to the whole Bible. Throughout the whole Bible, you can do that. And, I, you know, the Lord is, Psalms 23, just quote it. The Lord is my shepherd. Or stop. Look, what areas in my life am I allowing you not to shepherd me? Shepherd. And he might say, Leah, you're looking for love and acceptance in relationship. I'm the one that gives you that. Just from that scripture. He can speak to me deeply, intimately from one scripture that everyone quotes at funerals, the Lord is my shepherd, or Lord, what areas of my life am I not allowing you to be my shepherd? But I'm taking my life in control and I'm trying to supply my need. So I read that two years ago, I'm in a different place. I'm going to hear different things from the Holy Spirit. I read it a year ago, I'm in a different place. I'm going to hear something different. And if I read it yesterday, it's going to be different to today. And there's many ways as well in the whole Bible you can, do that to the, you can do that to every single scripture, but it's obviously going to take on a different form. Like I said, I told you in the letters, the letters say, you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I stop and go, wow. 
I'm blessed with very spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That, you know, that we have peace with God through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. I have peace with God. Thank you, Lord, that I have peace with you. Thank you that right now I'm at peace. I picture what does it look like to be at peace with God. I, I, I picture and I accept that I'm at one with God. That's what the word peace means. I'm at one with God. Thank you, Lord, that you are with me and I'm with you and you're not angry with me through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. I'm letting the Word minister life to me. I'm letting the Word speak to me. You can do that to the miracles of Jesus. I would encourage you to go through the miracles of Jesus and meditate. Imagine with your mind's eye the miracles of Jesus. You can literally close your eyes and picture, read, picture. When they took that crippled man uh, with, you know, with the stretcher and, and they, they tried to get him into the house that was full of people. The Bible says he, they tried everywhere possible to get in. They couldn't get in. I picture that. I picture them trying to go to the front door. They couldn't get in because it's full with people. Go to the back door. They still can't get in. They tried the window. They can't get in. I even pictured the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Stop it. No, no. It's too packed. This is all for the, the, the leaders, the Pharisees. And the, and the, no, you know, you can't come in. They got rejected. They could have said, oh, well, that's not the will of God. Oh, well, we tried. But they didn't. They said, you know what? We've got to get into Jesus. Let's find some rope. They got rope. They climbed the man's roof, the house. Someone owned this house. They opened the roof up, broke his roof and lowered him down. And you picture it. Imagine it. Let, let the Bible come alive. And then the Word will speak to you in that area. Amen. So you can do that to the whole Bible. I'm going to leave you with this. Because I have faith that you can do that. Spend time in the Word and let the Word read you. Let the Holy Spirit fellowship with you, speak with you, to you, while you're in His Word. What does this mean to me? How do, what do I need to change? Let all bitterness be put away from you. That's a good one. To stop. Who am I bitter with? Am I frustrated with anyone? Be kind and tenderhearted with everyone. Oh, stop there. Are you kind and tenderhearted to your husband and your wife? To your children? It's letting the Word speak to you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your love. We thank You for Your goodness. We know that Your Word is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing into dividing asunder of soul and spirit, even to the joints and marrow of the bone. So Father, we thank You that Your Word can speak into our spirit, and speak into our soul, speak into our mind, our will, our emotions, and transform us from within as we fellowship with the Holy Spirit, as we fellowship with You, Lord. We thank You that the Word will transform us, renew us, renew our thinking, and become more like Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' Name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen.